Hello, everyone. I'm Marcy Gallagher with Mountain Pacific Quality Health, and welcome to our webinar today, Antibiotic Safety and Healthcare Associated Infection Prevention. And this call will be recorded, so please make sure you mute your lines during the presentation. And the slides and the recording will be posted to our website. And when that information is available, uh, we will let you know. So at this time, I would like to introduce our speaker, Stevie Sai, uh, who is our uh, one of our pharmacists at Mountain Pacific. And she began in 2017 with us and is a graduate of the University of Wyoming School of Pharmacy where she received a doctor of pharmacy degree. And in 2019, she earned a master's of science in health services administration, where she studied health economics and outcome research. She currently works as a clinical analyst and subject matter expert, lending expertise to many healthcare quality improvement areas, including vaccine confidence and uptake, opioid stewardship, medication safety, improved healthcare access, and decreasing healthcare disparities. One of my favorite parts about Stevie's bio is she's powered by optimism, far too much caffeine, and a belief that individual healthcare workers can have meaningful impact on patients' and residents' lives through everyday interactions. So, Stevie, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcy, and thank you everyone for being with us today. Um, I appreciate you taking time out of your day. Um, we recognize that your time is very valuable. Um, as Marcy already mentioned, we're going to record this for your convenience. Um, and there are lots of ways to ask questions or provide comments as we move through the content today. Um, so if you have a question, a comment, um, something pressing, feel free to come off mute and just shout it out. Um, you can also use the Zoom features to raise your hand um, or the chat function is there as well. Um, so we welcome any and all feedback as we move through today. When we talk about antibiotic safety, antibiotic stewardship, and antimicrobial stewardship, um, I tend to use all of those words interchangeably. Um, they do mean different things, but they fall into the same bucket of sort of antibiotic and medication safety. And so you might hear those different things used interchangeably today. Um, and the general idea is we're going to be talking about using antibiotics appropriately and safely when we're using those terms. I always like to sort of kick off any discussion about antibiotic stewardship with this um, particular graphic that comes from Clatworth et al. Um, when we start talking about bacteria versus humankind, uh, bacteria tend to win the war. They are single-celled organisms for the most part. Uh, but they have been around for far longer than human beings. And you can really see as we move through the timeline of sort of antibiotic deployment, we developed our first antibiotics in the early 1900s. And almost immediately as we started rolling those out, those bugs that like to infect us began to combat our efforts. Um, resistance is very common. It's something that we talk about all the time any infectious, infectious disease specialist um, or professional that is worth their salt will tell you that they're probably afraid of dying from a multi-drug resistant organism. Um, there is real fear that um, we will be outpaced by these bacteria. And so it's super important as we utilize these tools in our healthcare toolbox that we use them appropriately and we retain their efficacy as much as we possibly can um, so that we don't get outpaced. When we first started talking about multi-drug resistant organisms, the conversation started a lot with methicillin resistance, staph, staph aureus, so MRSA. We have a whole slew of alphabet soup now of drug resistant organisms um, that cause pathogens in humans, and they're very hard to treat. Um, the more exposure people have, the more risk of that. But that's only one aspect of antibiotic resistance and antibiotic harm that we need to worry about in our patients. Uh, but this slide, I think, really captures how quickly things change um, and how important it is that we take these things seriously. 
daptomycin is my favorite one to look at because we noticed resistance to daptomycin within just a couple short years of it being released. Um, and most of the things on this chart are big gun antibiotics, those things that have really broad coverage. They um, are used for empiric therapy. So when we're not quite sure what the infectious organism is, um, which is most cases when we notice an infection for people, we don't always know what the um, infectious pathogen is typically at the beginning of every course of illness um, and might not discover it depending on where that illness is located and whether or not we can culture and all of those things. So keep this in the back of your mind as you're thinking about antibiotic safety and stewardship. Um, we have to win this war if we want to continue, you know, being the, the top of the food chain, so to speak. But we're also going to talk about um, C. diff, CDI, um, and it's important to talk about how the names around C. diff have changed in the last five years. Um, we used to just say um, Clostridium diff difficile, and now it is Clostridiotes difficile. There's only two, in a, two infectious uh, pathogens in that species, uh, but it just reminds us that we're all scientists at the end of the day. Um, and so when you're starting to hear those things, if you're seeing Clostridium, that might be an old resource and might be an opportunity to look at when it was made and whether or not it needs to be updated, um, just as kind of a nice gut check for where are we at. Um, and then always in our um, chronological sequence of healthcare, if it doesn't mention COVID, it's probably not from the last two years. So when you're looking at your tools and resources that you have in your facility, those are two nice checks to see how dated is this item. Um, and how current is it? Not a ton of things have changed in antibiotic stewardship in probably the last decade, um, but there are new best practices and we're learning new things all the time. So um, it's nice to have those, those easy checks to see where we're at. We do have just a couple objectives for today's discussion. I really wanted to make sure we talked about the impact that antibiotic use can have on patient health outcomes, whether that is positive or negative. Um, and then talk about some of those modifiable and non-modifiable risks that we have specifically for C. difficile infection and how we can reduce that risk for all of our nursing home residents and our communities, uh, because those two things are connected. And then last, we're gonna briefly talk about tools and resources, and then hopefully gather information from you in the audience to hear more about what is useful in your practice settings and the care settings and the communities you come from and what is missing that Mountain Pacific can hopefully provide. At Mountain Pacific, we have a really wonderful CEO. Her name is Sarah Medley. And she likes to talk a lot about our why for what we do at Mountain Pacific. And so when I was building this, um, this webinar, I was thinking a lot about, well, what is our why? We're asking you to come spend time with us. Um, we're asking you to do more things at work. And so there needs to be a reason, right? And it needs to be a compelling reason. It should hopefully be a good reason. Um, and when you start looking at antibiotic use, I think there are a lot of good reasons to use antibiotics appropriately. I showed you the slide earlier that talked about antibiotic resistance and um, organism resistance, uh, but also there is a lot of new information about the impact antibiotic use has specifically on nursing home residents. Uh, <clears throat> for this, um, this resource, the core elements of antibiotic stewardship in nursing homes, they gather a lot of really strong, powerful studies to build these recommendations. And when they started looking at lots of data from lots of nursing home residents, they noticed that 70% of nursing home residents receive one or more courses of, anti of systemic antibiotics, so not topicals, things they're eating or are um, injected into their body. And 40 to 75% of those antibiotics are likely unnecessary or inappropriate. Either they are too broad, they're covering too many things, or we're treating something where like maybe we have presence of bacteria, but it's not infectious. Um, humans are colonized with millions of 
or billions of bacteria, depending on where you're looking in our system. And if it's not causing a problem, that's just normal flora and we shouldn't mess with it. Um, so we really have to dig in, particularly with um, those people that are at the ends of our spectrum, the really old or the really young who are more sensitive to medications to make sure that we're using these appropriately. The other thing you have to look at in the new data that comes from antibiotic use and outcomes in nursing home residents is these are communities, right? Like our nursing homes are where people live. They are people's homes. It is a community and it's a subset of larger communities. People are coming in and out. Um, our staff in particular, families, we want people in and out of these homes um, visiting with residents and that creates a lot of blurred lines. When a nursing home is using a lot of antibiotics, um, in this particular study defined as more than 150 antibiotic days per 1,000 resident days, um, they increase the risk for every resident in that home, regardless of whether or not they receive an antibiotic, experience an antibiotic-related adverse event being exposed to antibiotic resistant organisms, and increasing the risk of CEDI in all residents. Um, as we start ticking up how many people are being exposed to antibiotics, regardless of whether or not that individual receives the antibiotic, their risk of having a drug resistant organism, a CDI or other antibiotic associated harm, um, sensitivities, those sorts of things all increase. So you really do have to think about the community approach because we are populated with normal flora all the time and antibiotics disrupt that normal flora. Um, it's very easy to pass bacteria from person to person just through casual everyday um, interactions, touching surfaces, touching hands, um, regardless of how much infection prevention practices we put into place, we will still see transmission of that normal flora. And so we have to have that um, as the basic understanding of the way that we're using antibiotics. You cannot isolate these things to just one resident. It has to be a system-wide approach or it will not work. So moving into like more of this why, Mountain Pacific serves um, a region that I assume most of you are familiar with, but it's Montana, Wyoming, Alaska, Hawaii, and the Pacific Territories. And we are tasked by various um, state and federal agencies to look at a lot of different things. This particular information on your screen here has to do with fee-for-service Medicare beneficiaries who reside in nursing homes and their rate of common infections. So looking from baseline, which was, um, 2019, 2020, right around in there, we tried to roll the two together to offset the impact of COVID. Um, all the way to 2022, you can see that that rate of infection really creeped up during the COVID-19 pandemic and then has slowly, steadily plateaued and then maybe even edged up a little bit more as we're sort of coming out of that COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this looks at rates of COVID-19, pneumonia, sepsis, urinary tract infection um, for nursing home residents that result in a hospital stay. So, you know, critically during 2020, a lot of things happened that impacted the way that we approach infection prevention. COVID-19 is obviously included in there, but COVID-19 is not the sole responsible infectious process driving these hospitalization rates. Um, you all really should hopefully have a moment to pat yourselves on the back. Um, nursing home staff became immediate experts in how to reduce resident harm from COVID-19. All of the time and effort that that required meant that you had to probably shift some focus from other things you normally do, looking at reducing risk of pneumonia, reducing risk of influenza, 
reducing risk of our cauti and clopsy, UTIs, soft tissue infections, all of those things that are just integral parts of caring for people with thin skin, um, weakened immune system. There's only so many hours you have in your work time and only so much brain power you can bring to the table. And so throughout the pandemic, as we asked you to do more and more and more with the same or often fewer resources than you had, there was a shift and we started to see more sepsis, more soft tissue infection, and also a lot more inappropriate antibiotic use, um, primarily driven by those prescribers that see patients in your facilities um, or in your communities. But we're starting to see the impact of that. We are seeing more hospitalization because of those things. And so we have to shift our focus and start talking about these things again as we move past sort of this beginning part of COVID. We have to get back to business as usual because things have changed. This re state remains the same regardless of whether or not we're looking at your long stay residents or your short stay residents. Um, we'll talk later in the, the talk today about stratifying your different residents, looking at different groups and different um, situations that can impact how they respond to things, regardless of whether a resident is short stay or long stay, their risk of being hospitalized for those infections is higher now than it was prior to the pandemic. This is also the case when we start talking about CDI or C, C difficile, C, yeah, C difficile infection, sorry. Um, this is very variable because it's pretty um, uncommon, thankfully. Infection prevention practices really work for reducing C. diff transmission in nursing homes. And so most of these infections are not happening because it's transmitting from one resident to another because we aren't using our infection prevention protocols. Um, those things are working. What is not working is the way we're utilizing antibiotics outside of those times. And so we're still seeing a lot of volatility in our C. diff rates, and we're starting to see it trend up. When you start breaking this apart by long stay and short stay, um, we did better for a long period of time with our long stay. We were really seeing things drop off there, which makes good sense, right? Like they're in in the community longer, we have the opportunity to train them, their family, make sure they're connected with a good provider, get to know them, know whether or not a, the presence of a bacteria is truly infectious or if they just happen to be colonized. Um, that makes sense that we get good at long stay resident health because you know them, you know these people that, that live in the communities where you work. Short stay is tougher. And that also makes sense. Um, these are people that are typically in for like rehab or they've had an event. They are often fresh out of the hospital um, where they probably received an antibiotic. And antibiotic use is our number one modifiable risk factor for CDI. And so looking at those two things, that makes good sense. But also you can really start to see the impact of changing our focus around antibiotic stewardship during the pandemic in that both of these rates are starting to ebb up, which is a good community indicator that we are overutilizing antibiotics um, and need to make a change before we really start to see rates increase. So when we start talking about antibiotic stewardship, I like this little quote and explanation from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, this is really just talking about a set of commitments and activities, um, a system, and at Quality Improvement, we love systems, um, where we reduce these adverse events. Um, because any harm from an antibiotic is an adverse event, um, and any inappropriate utilization of antibiotics is a potential adverse event. And so we have to really start looking at it that way, the same way we do with opioids, the same way we do with anticoagul anticoagulants, chemotherapy agents, um, they all carry serious risks and benefits. And so we have to look at them critically and make sure they are necessary. Um, in pharmacy school, they talk a lot about how the dose, is, the dose makes the poison. And that is very much the case with the antibiotic. 
world. Um, you have to use them carefully uh, because every time you introduce a medication, you are risking an adverse event for that patient. So I have a quick review of the core elements. Um, and I'm not gonna hit on all of these because I think most people are pretty familiar. Uh, the biggest ones I would say is like for this slide, when we talk about leadership commitment, this is not just having a policy in place. This is making sure you have the necessary human, financial and, and technology resources in place to allow people to do this job. It must be written into a job description that person has to be able to have the time in their work day to get these things done. Um, and if those things are not being prioritized, you don't truly have leadership commitment in your organization. Um, and that creates just a giant barrier to everything else I will say after this. Um, you have to have that foundation in order to move forward. And so if you don't have someone in your facility that has this in their job description where they get to own it, and they have the authority and the um, support of everyone above them to make sure that's happening, you obviously can't move past that point. Um, so keep that in the back of your mind. That's always sort of the low hanging opportunity when it comes to antibiotic stewardship. Often, the minute somebody gets the authority and the ability to watch things, we see improvement. Um, we can always continue to improve. All of these things are never events where we want to try to get to zero, but also zero is not attainable. We have to continually improve that process and that has to be driven by passionate people. Um, so once you move through there, you need a team. Um, ideally, you'll have a physician leader, nursing leaders, um, people in your facility that are passionate about this are great. People looking for a challenge. Uh, you need to partner with your consultant pharmacies. If they do not have the ability to um, devote time and effort to this, that is something to discuss during sort of your review of their services. Um, all pharmacists are trained in antibiotic stewardship and should be able to help you with this. Um, and there's ample training available to them if they don't feel like they have the skills or you feel like they have deficiencies. Um, perfectly reasonable conversations to have with people. Um, that's absolutely a service you should expect from your pharmacy services team. You have to have action. We have to pick one thing and do it. And then once we get good at that thing, we move on to the next thing and we keep moving and building that system like we were talking about. Um, and then you have to measure it. We are setting goals and looking at things and in healthcare, we like data. Um, as a data scientist, I love data. It's my favorite. And so I get really passionate when we start talking about picking action and tracking and reporting. Uh, because it can be very rewarding to look at these rates fall and look at um, fewer resident days with antibiotic coverage and fewer harms from antibiotics um, and watch how that can impact your overall community as well. Often when one group of people start to really get good at antibiotic stewardship, many others in the community um, will follow along and then we all are safer. Antibiotic stewardship is, is a worldwide need uh, because we're all at risk. Um, and then lastly, there is education. You should be given time to pursue training in these things. Everyone should have a base level knowledge about if we have bacteremia in urine, do we need an antibiotic or do we not? Everyone in your facility should feel comfortable and confident being able to answer that and then educating residents and their families on these topics. Um, not every single bacteria that's present is harmful. And for the most part, we need to go ahead and um, preserve our normal flora because that is what protects us from these um, opportunistic infections like CDI. Um, and I see in chat, can I give an example of a milestone or evaluation metric that would be a good start? And I absolutely can. Um, toward the end, we're gonna talk about a lot of these, but looking just at the number of antibiotics that you start in your facility, like who is issued a prescription for an antibiotic, just tallying those can be your first milestone that you start looking at. And then looking at the trending, are we going up or are we going down? Um, how is that rate changing with the number of residents we have in our facility? 
um, it can be as, as simple or complex as the needs of your system and ties in really well with how available technology is for you um, and how supportive your pharmacy team is. And so I'll give three examples at the end, but just start thinking about like, are we tracking anything? Do we keep track of who is on? Are you offering um, infusion services in your facility? Is there antibiotics associated with that? Um, we ask nursing home staff to do more and more and more all the time. Um, and so looking at, are we using those big guns? Do we have IV antibiotics in our facility? Let's track those. And then you can add on the orals. Um, that's a good place to start. And then talking again about our why, when we talk about CDI, it is not super prevalent in nursing home populations, thankfully, but in general, it is pretty common in the United States. Um, there are 450,000 cases of CDI each year. About half of those will be hospitalized, um, will be people occur in people who are hospitalized, usually um, not present on admission, but develop through the course of treatment for other um, events. And it does cause death. Um, in 2019, 12,800 people died due to CDI. Um, that was the definitive cause of death for those individuals. Um, this can be a life-changing experience for a lot of people. People who have CDI are very, very ill. If you've seen residents that have it, you know this. Um, and it is very hard to get rid of once you have it. We create an imbalance in our normal flora and that allows um, CDI to, oh, the C diff to overgrow. That produces a toxin, which breaks down the lining of our intestines. I mean, it's a pretty destructive course of illness. Um, massive dehydration happens with people, poor nutrition. Um, and for about a quarter of patients who experience a primary event of CDI, they will have recurrence. And in that quarter of people who have one event of CDI, 40 to 65 of them will, 65% of them will go on to have subsequent issues. Um, recurrence of CDI is one of the biggest issues. Once you get diagnosed, um, we are looking to prevent that second and third and fourth case, uh, because as you have more events, more occurrences, the risk of infecting other people goes up your risk of increased morbidity and mortality goes up, um, patient harm goes up. And then on the other side of this, you can see all the costs associated with this. As you have more events of CDI, it costs more, which makes excellent sense. Um, we spend about $5.4 billion annually in the United States um, to treat CDI. Um, and 700 million of those dollars are expenses incurred outside of healthcare settings. So 4.7 billion have to do with hospitalization costs, cost of care in nursing homes, cost of care in outpatient facilities, the prescription medications to treat CDI. $700 million is a like societal cost where caretakers are missing time from work they are being asked to drive distances to treat people. Um, people are unable to work because they're so ill. And so we, all, we always worry about the cost of the healthcare system. But also, I like to point out when we're seeing those expenses incurred outside of the system, because when you get C. diff infection, it is a life-altering event. You, that person is very, very, very ill. And it requires just a ton of care. Typically, we follow those individuals for 12 months after their primary event um, or their latest recurrence just to make sure they're out of the woods. Um, so it's not a one and done illness. Um, we really have to watch that window. And then looking at the average cost per patient in that window, if you are looking at um, just one person who has one episode, it's about a $72,000 healthcare expenditure. 
those that have three or more reoccurrences average $207,000. And so most nursing homes operate on a very small profit margin. Um, there's absolutely no way you can eat that cost. Um, the same goes for our critical access hospitals, most of our hospital communities. Um, this is not something that, that the healthcare system bears well. And so we really have to make sure that we're reducing it as much as possible. And then obviously the payers of, involved in the system would really like to see this as well because it's impacting them as well. So looking at those non-modifiable risks, there are some things we just can't change about the patients that are at risk for C. diff. Um, it's commonly found in the environment. When we started talking about this internally at Mountain Pacific, we um, had a discussion about, can people be colonized? Yes, absolutely. People can be colonized with C. diff. Um, as long as they do not have symptoms of illness, it's like any other presence of bacteria. If you aren't acting sick, you're not sick. Um, but you can transmit it to other people um, if you're not doing good hand washing and those sorts of things. That can be a source of contamination. And it's probably where we see things where we have no idea where the point of infection is for people. Um, members of the community can just carry this just like they can MRSA, just like they can E. coli. Um, 80% of CDI occurs in people over the age of 65. There are lots of reasons for this, um, but primarily it's just a process of aging. Our body is more at risk the older we are, and it takes less to tip the scale from well to ill. Complicated medical care is another one of those big risks. Every single person who resides in a nursing home falls into this complicated medical care bucket which is kind of silly because some of them truly are just living out the end of their life um, and are relatively healthy, uh, but just their presence in that facility puts them at that risk. And then those that have a serious health issue, who have chronic disease, who are in and out of um, acute care settings, that risk increases more for them. Um, and then compromised immune system is last there. And everyone over the age of 65 should be considered to have a compromised immune system. If you have patients who are being treated for some sort of autoimmune disorder with a disease modifying drug, have an increased risk. And so you really have to start thinking about who is in your patient population, who's living in that nursing home, um, to start thinking about overall of the members of your community, what is their overall risk? Um, some of them might have one of these or two of them. Some might have, you know, all four. And so it's important to start thinking about what the risk is and then what can we do about that risk. That's where we start really looking at that modifiable category. You can't change someone's age, but you can look at other things. Um, so looking at that C. diff infection, again, the, the homes that we monitor at Mountain Pacific we don't see a lot of resident to resident transmission. So infection prevention practices are clearly working. Um, hopefully we have really honed our infection prevention skills during this pandemic um, and we'll continue to be rock stars with that. Um, but continue with the hand washing, be wary of pandemic fatigue uh, because that increases our risk for other things. And then looking at other categories, like is someone needing to have GI surgery or manipulation? What can we do to further reduce their risk? Um, depending on the nature of the patient's overall health, is this really necessary? Is the risk worth it? Um, looking at those things is very important. And then avoiding high-risk antibiotics. Most of the things on this list, the fluoroquinolones, the third and fourth generation cephalosporins, clindamycin, carbapenems, the reason they're on this list is because these are big gun, broad spectrum antibiotics. They go in and they kill a lot of things in a system. They take care of the infection, but also they wipe out a lot of the normal flora that we need. And then that allows the overgrowth of the infectious pathogen. And that's what creates the illness. And so whenever possible, we have to make sure the antibiotic selected is as specific as it can be for the likely pathogen. Um, and then look at your community trends. 
Can your pharmacy team talk to you about um, what an antibiogram looks like for your community? Is that available from your healthcare settings? Um, can you partner with your hospital? Um, this is where that expertise really comes into play because most healthcare members know what an antibiogram is, but we don't want to have to sit and read it and interpret it. Um, there are experts for that. So make sure that you have access to them and you're utilizing them uh, because we have to match bugs to drugs whenever possible. Uh, because people who are on these high-risk antibiotics are seven to 10 times more likely to get C. diff in that month after their use. Um, so reducing and only using them when we truly have to is critically important. There are lots of good statistics and stats in the chat for you. As we move into our next category here, I mentioned at the top of the hour that we are hopeful to gather some information from you as experts on what you need um, to talk about what is and isn't working and what else Mountain Pacific can do to support you. And so we're gonna have some polling questions. So um, my friend Mary is going to help pull those up and we will do just a few polling questions, shake out your worries and your weariness. Um, and then after we talk about tools and resources, um, we're gonna open the lineup for discussion. The first question we have here is, do you have an antibiotic stewardship committee or a formalized process? Yes or no, is it under development? If there's something you wanna explain, please feel free to pop that in chat. Um, we're very curious and it's, you know, think about this in the context of what we talked about earlier. Or is it supported in a way where it can be effective? Um, we'd like to know that as well. We'll give that about 10 more seconds. If anybody has any more answers. All right, we can go ahead and close that. It looks like about 70% of you do have a formalized process. You have a committee, 10% do not, and 20% are developing it now. Um, this continues to be a need. Um, it's mandated in a lot of places, but we know mandate doesn't always mean that it gets applied um, in a way that's meaningful. So um, we appreciate that. We'll go ahead and move on to the next polling question. We're curious, would you be interested in an antibiotic stewardship development educational series? Um, is there a starting place that would make sense? Uh, please go ahead and indicate yes or no. And if there are specific things that we talked about today that really would benefit you, feel free to pop that in chat. I see Kelly's comment in chat also about uh, the statement, match bugs to drugs. Um, I was fortunate to be trained by a very talented infectious disease pharmacist and she drilled bugs to drugs, like that was her motto. Um, and so we could definitely talk about making that the motto for our program. <laughs> we'll go ahead and give this another 10 seconds. Oh, it looks, thank you, Mary. Um, so it looks like most of you are interested in that. And so we'll take that back to our development team. If we can move on to the next polling question, please. So then we would like to know, are you interested in learning more about healthcare acquired infections and their prevention in nursing home facilities? Typically those healthcare acquired infections would be things like CLADI, COPSI, CLA, oh man, those acronyms are hard, UTIs, um, injection site infections, soft tissue infections, wound care, those sorts of things. Um, but traditionally we're talking about um, things associated with catheters, whether in the urethra or other places in the body. We can give that one another 10 seconds. All 
All right. And if we can go on to our next question. So this question um, is a short answer and we're using some of our advanced Zoom features. If you can't see it, um, you might not have advanced Zoom features enabled on your, um, your setup. So we're asking what areas of assistance or education could Mountain Pacific offer to the people attending today? Um, feel free if you have it available in your polling, go ahead and add it in there or please put it in chat. Um, we would very much like to make this time meaningful and get you the tools and resources you most need. And so um, any advice or guidance you have for us is greatly appreciated. So we'll give this one another 30 seconds. Um, and if you're not quite done when we close the poll, feel free to keep going. About five seconds left on that. All right. And then do we have another question to bring up, Mary, or is that it? That's all. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, everyone, for participating. If you weren't able to put in um, what other things you would like to feel free to pop those in chat, or if you don't want to put it out there for everyone to see, you can send it directly to anybody by pulling down on the menu where it says everyone, um, or you can send it to whoever your contact at Mountain Pacific is for um, nursing home quality improvement. Uh, we always appreciate feedback. Um, with that, I'm going to move into tools and resources. This is going to be a really short section because our hope is um, for those of you that attend the It's Worth a Shot program, we're going to do a little bit more content again on December 14th, uh, but didn't want to leave today without talking about things. My favorite tool and resource to use when it comes to antibiotic stewardship is the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, one, it's just incredibly comprehensive. Almost every aspect of antibiotic stewardship and antimicrobial stewardship and the different areas of communities can be found on here. And it's um, free use material. You don't have to have a subscription. You don't have to hide behind a paywall. Um, you can find really good quality information on the CDC website. They have entire sections dedicated specifically to long-term care facilities, nursing home residents, um, and then they also break it down further into different areas of focus. So once you are tracking your, um, your antibiotic starts, how many residents you have on antibiotics, once you get your days of therapy, um, those are sort of the big things to get your arms around. Then you can start looking and seeing what else do we have going on that is meaningful to our organization and the people that live here and how can we impact that. So you can dig into, we're seeing rates of multi-drug resistant organisms in our community. We're going to dig into that and work on it. Or we're seeing more cotty than we would like. We're seeing clopsy. Or I don't even know what those things mean. This is a good place to go and start. Um, I suspect most people are very familiar with those, but um, information is changing all the time. Our infection prevention processes, um, again, got honed during the pandemic. We're really good at these things. And so now it's time to start moving on to the next level. What can we do extra um, so that we reduce those harms to the residents that we all care about? Uh, when you start talking about measuring antibiotic use, um, there is an appendices available specific for nursing homes that sort of walk you through the beginning parts. If you're not collecting anything at this moment, or you feel like you could be doing more, or you just want to review the process, um, they have Appendix B, where you measure antibiotic prescribing use and outcomes. Point prevalence antibiotic use is a really easy way of uh, measuring. You're just doing a survey at a specific point in time. 
of how many residents are receiving antibiotics during that given time period. You can use your medication administration record or your MAR for that. Um, you can ask your pharmacy team to do that for you. It's just a snapshot of time where you say of 129 residents, we had 30 on an antibiotic during this given time period. Um, there are some techniques and strategies to make this useful, varying it throughout seasons, um, looking at whether or not you have a specific um, diagnosis that's driving this, those sorts of things. You can get further into it, um, but just this snapshot technique um, doesn't require anything more than you can do it with pencil and paper if you really have to, because it's just a tally. Um, so everyone can measure something, which is nice. It's nice to have those entry level things. Uh, moving on from that, you can look at antibiotic starts. So this is that rate of new antibiotics initiated. So who has an infectious organism and who is receiving an antibiotic prescription. Um, so you're going to want to look at those new prescriptions over the total number of residence days, usually per like a thousand residence days and those sorts of things. That's where the appendices is helpful. Um, it digs more into like how to make that rate meaningful, how to break it down to your facility, how to use that math so that you can drive quality. But again, this is something where you can ask your pharmacy team how many prescriptions were issued, and then you just count up the number and you divide it by your resident days. Um, typically with antibiotics, you want to count every single antibiotic. So it doesn't matter if a patient is on combination, you don't have to figure out um, well, Ms. Smith had three antibiotics for this one infection. Doesn't matter, you count all three and you move forward with your life. Um, so those are good places to start. Um, and then you can start getting a little bit more into the um, ability to look at how that is being driven. And we start calculating days of therapy. This is how hospital systems are typically asked to track antibiotic days. So looking at for each resident, however many days we have them in there um, for the course of the year, how many of those days for every resident had an antibiotic present. And again, more information can be found, but you're looking at if they're on amoxicillin for seven days and they're a nursing home resident for 98 days, they had seven over 98, that's their days of therapy for that stay. And then you'd roll that all up for your entire facility. And again, same thing happens if they're on two antibiotics during that time period, you count them both. Um, this is nice because you can really start stratifying, looking at what antibiotics are most common, what disease states are most common, who is prescribing these things. If you start noticing wild differences based on where the resident lives, um, the the drugs being prescribed, who's prescribing them, you can really quickly identify who are your outliers and start figuring out why. It's not always um, a problem. Sometimes it's perfectly appropriate, but it's a nice place again for that quick gut check of how do we do this? Um, and then last, you've got the utilization ratio there, and that's looking at the total monthly day of therapy to your total monthly residence days. And that's where you start getting into is our nursing home a high utilizer of antibiotics? Are we medium? Are we low? And digging into where do we fall on that spectrum? Uh, because that helps you know, how are you doing? It's nice to compare yourself against some of those national averages uh, because again, these are, these are never events. We wanna move towards zero as much as we can, knowing that we also have to have realistic goals along the way. All right. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and pause today, open the floor up for any um, questions, open discussion. We would love to hear more from you about what would be useful. I see in the chat that um, strategies for educating prescribers, particularly those outside specialties, um, would be a great place to go. I agree with that. Um, dental is another place where we need more antibiotic stewardship. And so keep them coming. Let us know um, what feels useful to you and what your barriers are. And if you have any successes you'd like to share. Um, and then Mary's also put in the chat an evaluation 
let us know how we did today. Please um, complete that before you go. And I will be quiet now so that you can talk. Hey Stevie, this is Brian Hall. I just had a question. Um, we have a program in place. It's just what I'm struggling with. Um, I, I came from an acute care setting and pharmacy played a big role in the, the stewardship. Um, what I'm finding in the long-term care, at least here, their role is not as in real time. Um, so that the antibiotic usage is not being reviewed as it's being ordered per se to make sure it's appropriate or the right antibiotic has been ordered. Um, I'm used to that being there. So what do you see long-term care facilities doing to adjust that, to try to get more real-time review? Yeah, um, that's an excellent question. Um, and it's absolutely a barrier right now. I, I've seen a couple different things. Um, one, we know that those systems used in acute care work um, antibiotic timeouts work, reviewing cultures work. And so I see the industry changing. Um, that's always slow, but I do expect that pharmacy will catch up and those ex expectations will move into long-term care. Um, in the meantime, if you have expertise available in your facility where you can start implementing some of those things like an antibiotic timeout, where you look, did we do a culture? Did the culture come back? Does this match? Um, if you're able to have that quick consultation with the provider, um, that seems to be uh, the, the best solution for people at this time. It's difficult because it's very much on the staff at the nursing home. Um, but if you're able to put that into any sort of electronic reminder system, that's typically how successful acute care systems work. And so looking at, do we have a tickler system that we can use um, that will remind us when somebody's been on something for say 72 hours, can we have a timeout? Can we do a brief consultation? Um, that's usually the best place to start for that. Thank you. And it looks like April had a comment in chat. Feel free, April, if you're able to come off mute and talk with us. Uh, but for the reoccurrent cotties, yeah, looks like Lori. Lori, did you want to say anything more about that? So, and I would say, you know, like digging into this comment, so her question had to do people who are on um, prophylactic anti-infective drugs um, in consultation with ID specialists. There are some people in some situations where antibiotics are absolutely appropriate and we need to use them. Um, and, and this is just uh, where it's really critically important to make sure that we're treating the whole person and not just reliant on the system. Like we obviously need these things in place but you are going to have um, times where you evaluate it, you decide it's effective, it's necessary. Um, and then we modify as many other risks as we can. So looking at, do we supplement with um, gut health flora? Um, can we use, I'm a big proponent of probiotics. Um, there's good evidence that that does seem to help with a lot of people. And so looking at those things, talking with the patient and their family about what um, what works best for their situation, um, knowing that sometimes people just do need antibiotics. I feel like some of our families are probably more, how do I say, contribute more to the process of staying on these antibiotics. I've got um, two of them, one which is a retired RN who consistently says, oh, I can tell all the signs. She's got another UTI. 
Well, this woman's had a super pubic catheter for 13 years. Yep. She was colonized. Yes. And, you know, basically a few cephalosporins is all she's she can tolerate anymore. She she reacts badly to the other drugs. Nothing else is is covering her bacterium, so it's constantly going back on septamir or cephalosporin of some sort. And I mean, honestly, I feel like we're over treating the heck out of this poor woman. Yeah. Yep. And. I bet your instincts are 100% spot on. Um, one of the things we discussed here is talking about tools and resources for that family education, uh, because of course they want their loved one to be healthy and to feel well. Um, and old school, you know, even just a decade ago, if you had any sort of change in that person's overall health, they probably have a UTI. We probably should treat that. Um, and now we know that we've overtreated a lot of people. Um, and so I empathize with you trying to educate that family. Um, and we will see what we can find for tools and resources specifically about that because I'm positive you're not the only one. Oh, I'm sure I'm not. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. This is Lori uh, Chiquick, Infection Preventionist. And I, I'd like to just add to that, Stevie, you're exactly right. It's, we always need to take our the best opportunities in long-term care to review um, current practices. So going back to the comment on the patient, for instance, who had the neurogenic bladder and, and some issues and, and had a long-term indwelling catheter. Well, we're reviewing best practices for treatment modalities. So is an indwelling catheter really the best practice in that case? So the best prevention of the cauti is not having a catheter. So for me, I always, as an infection preventionist, like, how can I get that catheter out? And, you know, in, in that case, for instance, would intermittent catheterization actually be a better option? So be sure to explore all of those options um, as, as well. Things do change over, over time. So um, maybe explore the best practices to see if there may be another potential for reducing the risk of a cauti. Um, such as being able to, you know, change the protocol and, you know, going from a long-term indwelling catheter to intermittent catheterization. Okay. Maybe it's a good opportunity just to interject too. And I, I did put a little note about this in, in chat, but um, for, for probably most of our facilities, we utilize some kind of electronic healthcare record system. A very common one I see used is point-click care. So I don't know if that rings a bell with some of you or not, but um, point-click care, for instance, as do other systems, may include a section on antibiotic stewardship. They may actually already have a tool built in for tracking antibiotic use with the requirements from CMS on antibiotic stewardship and antibiotic stewardship programs in our long-term cares, it would be a really good time to advocate for using um, one of those tools. So if it costs additional money, I would say, you know, advocate for it from that perspective. Hey, this is a requirement and here's an easy way we can do it. So if you are ordering or using or uh, have a MAR within your electronic health record system in your long-term care, your antibiotics are already listed there. And you may already have a tool where you can actually already get things like antibiotic days um, used. You may even look at the types and it depends, you know, the breakdowns may be different in a different program, but explore that option as well. It may save a lot of time and labor. And especially for those of you who may not have a pharmacist uh, um, as close at hand as you would like currently, just might, it might be something to look into. I agree with Lori. There are more and more programs um, that have that available at your fingertips. So yeah, dig in, look and see what's in your systems that you have in place first, and then what is available as an add-on. Um, a lot of times it's just as simple as someone turning it on for you. Um, and then this is like, we're re not rewriting history here. Like this has been a part of healthcare for a long time. Um, we just are bad about giving tools and resources to all levels of care. And so making sure that you have access to that is important. Um, looks like we also have a comment from Holly about more discussion on non-prescription treatments and therapies for infections. Um, I agree with that. There are some great community resources that um, would likely work well 
for um, discussions with families and residents as well about watchful waiting and like non antibiotic treatments, uh, that information on when it's a, a virus and when it is bacteria. We can't treat viral illnesses with bacteria and so, or with antibiotics, excuse me. And so, um, more of those things will be helpful. And then we'll reach out. Um, looks like we have more opportunity to teach in the, in the rest of the community as well. Those ambulatory sites, acute care and long-term care would be helpful. Okay. All right, and then Nick has a comment about PCC's antibiotic stewardship tool, um, making things easier for your infection preventionists, but also accessible to other staff. Um, team-based care for the win there. We do need to make it to where everyone can be a part of the team. It cannot fall just on one person. Your infection preventionist obviously can't be everywhere all the time. Um, and so finding ways to integrate that into the total healthcare team is really helpful. Looks like we are about two minutes past the hour now. So um, I wanted to just go ahead and close today's session. Thank you very much for your time and attendance. We appreciate your comments and feedback. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us if something comes to you later, or if you didn't get to add something that you would like to share. Uh, we welcome your feedback and your information. And thank you so much for spending part of your Tuesday with me or Wednesday if you're in Guam.